You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to episode 27 of the Crisis in the Church series. This week, we're speaking with Father Patrick Summers, the District Superior of the Society of St. Pius X in Asia, about ecumenism. Ecumenism, as we have already seen in episode 23, was one of the driving factors behind the Novus Ordo Mass. But today, we'll explore the other effects of ecumenism on the Catholic Church, and how, instead of being the new way to evangelize, as was blindly promised, threatens to turn Catholicism into a schizophrenic religion. If you'd like to learn more about this series we're doing on the crisis in the church, or go back and revisit our previous 26 episodes, or if you want to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Now, we'll turn to our conversation with Father Summers. Well, we're back with another episode of the SSPX podcast and the Crisis in the Church series, and very happy to welcome Father Patrick Summers back to this podcast and this video series. Hello, Father. How are you? Very good, Andrew. Thanks for uh, having me on. It's it's been a long time since we talked last. And and for those those who may not uh, remember from our last interview, Father Summers is the uh, superior of the District of Asia for the Society of Saint Pius X, and you are in Malaysia right now, or Sri Lanka, or I'm in uh, Malaysia right now in uh, quarantine, which is required before you're allowed out to uh, start working for the for the good of the faithful here in Malaysia who have not seen a priest for almost a year. So. Wow, a year, and and you you must be chomping at the bit to to get out and and go be able to visit them and see them and provide the sacraments and and you're stuck in a hotel literally in a hotel room you were telling me for fourteen days or something. Uh, this one is a ten day quarantine. So, Oof. yeah. Well, it's well, a good we opportunity for us to catch up with doing this. That's anyway. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, we wanted to have you on uh, to talk about ecumenism. We've just finished talking about the Noah's Ordo Mass and going through uh, four or five episodes on the on the Mass itself. Uh, and now we're going to pivot to ecumenism. We talked about it a little bit when we were talking about the Second Vatican Council and some of those documents. Right, right, um, right. But ecumenism really is one of those things that has been developing ever since. So. I guess to start, Father, could we look at what the Catholic Church should, has traditionally taught about ecumenism? Right. Uh, it's, it's a good question because there is this very true, uh, very good uh, concept, uh, truth of, of ecumenism, a good and healthy ecumenism, I would say, that you know, the Catholic Church from the, from the time of the apostles uh, has always practiced a true ecumenism. I mean, without it, we wouldn't be sitting here as Catholics now. Our Lord coming, he speaks to them saying, all power is given to me on heaven and earth. Go therefore teach you all nations, baptizing them in the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them and observing all to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Uh, behold, I am with you all days in the consummation of the world. You know, he says very clearly, one should go forth and teach them the truths of uh, divine revelation. Uh, and then I want you to, you know, baptize them bring them into the church, give them the means to to save their soul. So, yeah, there is a very true ecumenism, which is we want to bring all all souls, all possible, as much as possible, all souls into the the, the true faith so that, that they can save their souls. I mean, that's that's the true ecumenism that church has always held, at least until very recently. And, and it's there. There are two big points in in the statement of our Lord there. Teach. And baptize, meaning it's not just open up the doors and let people in. Mm. Ecumenism is about actively going out and and bringing people into the faith. Yeah, that there, yeah, there are certain things that need to be done. It's not just saying, "Hey, the faith is, is here's the faith. Everyone's everyone's in it." It's well, yeah, there are actual truths that are salvific that that need to be believed. I mean, that's that's sort of our our Lord says, you know, he he is God. He says, "This is the requirements for this faith." Uh, for this union with God, for this salvation of your souls, for eternal happiness, here's what you must do. So since the early 20th century, before, after, especially during the Second Vatican Council, this whole idea of ecumenism uh, has really has really changed. Uh, yes, we'll see as we as we go through this talk that um, it's there's sort of a historical, uh, let's say, movement in the you know 1800s and early 1900s, with with especially really amongst the the Protestants, um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And then it sort of was adopted by some of the more liberal uh, 
clergy, uh, and uh, and that and that sort of developed its way into uh, the the Second Vatican Council with the the document Unitatis Redintegratio, Redin this restoration of unity. It's they're the big document on ecumenism, um, and yeah, so it sort of I would say it's, it was almost like a century long in preparation this movement, and that's why Pius XI. Let's say after the world, first world war, the Great War, he said, "Okay, there's this movement. We need to talk about it." And uh, he puts out Mortalium Animos in 1928, less than a, a decade after the the Great War. So, Second Vatican Council, it has what Archbishop Lefebvre said: there is this trilogy of errors. There's this, and it really kind of harkens back to the French Revolution. Archbishop Lefebvre mentioned this: there's this liberty, equality, fraternity, and it, and it totally bastardizes the the sense of what the Catholic Church is. Mm. Yes, as as you say, he writes about that in his book, Open Letter to Confused Catholics, uh, 1985. But he talks about you know that there is this trilogy of errors from the that we saw very clearly in the in the French Revolution, which is now sort of uh, being uh, let's say paralleled or aped in in the in the council and in the, in the church that you know they want a religious liberty, which is false. They want instead of equality, they want a collegiality. Uh, and then instead of just human fraternity, they want religious fraternity or ecumenism. So these, these errors of, of the great, um, and horrific French Revolution became, became adopted into the, the thinking of these modernists in the, in the Second Vatican Council. As we start looking at the true meaning of ecumenism or ecumenical, we, what comes to mind initially, at least for me, is the is the wording of, of ecumenical councils. Um, mm. So, how yeah. does that relate to what the church has taught about ecumenism? Ec- ecumenical council, uh, for those of us who have been bathed in this modern uh, church speak for the last 50, 60 years, uh, <laughs> kind of makes it sound like ecumenical council. That's not a good thing, um, but it was a good thing back then. Well, right, yeah, I, th- I think that comes back to the to the original ideas. Ecumenism is a go- is 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 in itself a true ecumenism is a good thing. It's um, it just as you say the the word has become a bad word in some ways, um, but it just means it's just this idea of the the entire uh, inhabited earth. As I say, it's it's sort of a general, a, a bit like the word Catholic. It's sort of this idea of a universal, uh, a large. In the question of the councils, it meant. The gathering of all the bishops of the world. It was okay. All the bishops of the world are there under the direction of the Pope. It's an ecumenical council, which there are many ecumenical councils and very good councils, general councils. We would say, as opposed to like a more individual. This is a council just for the for the country of Italy, or this is just a council for you know America. You know, there's certain ecumenical was it meant it was all together the whole earth. So ecumenical, yes, absolutely, it, it can mean a good thing. Uh, for most of history, it's been a very good thing, and now we sort of say, "Oh gosh, ecumenical." That's that's a bad word. Um, it's sort of a hijacking of the word again. So let's look at what Pope Pius XI said: uh, "Mortalium animos." This was this encyclical that you mentioned just a, just a few minutes ago. He wrote this in 1928, mm-hmm. and and what is he saying about ecumenism in this document, Father? But yeah, so Pius XI, uh, to go briefly into that, he, he sort of he says, "Okay, listen, there is this movement." Uh, amongst this, they desire this collaboration of the various Christian churches. They want to have a unity amongst all of them so that, you know, there's this lowest common denominator. We all agree on something so we can have a, a unity of, of churches. You know, there's a world council of churches. There's, there's all these different meetings, even in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, but in Mortalium Animos, this, this great encyclical of 1928, um, he says, yeah, he says, look, there is a keen desire. There is this desire for unity and peace. It's very understandable. You know, it, so many, so many have died recently in the great war. It's not less than 10 years ago, but I have to disapprove with it because it assumes that all religions are equally good. Uh, and it rejects the religion revealed by God. It says, no, no, there is not. No one has the fullness of truth. Uh, no religion is actually fully true. We all have bits and pieces of it. So we just need to all come together and agree on, on, um, on some basic, uh, tenets, some basic doctrine. So, you know, that's so he sort of starts out saying, listen, we cannot approve of this. Uh, all religions are not equally good. It, it can lead to naturalism. It can lead to indifferentism. 
Uh, and frankly, it just says that there is no true one true church instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, the main <laughs> the main problem here. Um, there are many who would say, who would counter that argument, and probably many who did at the time, who would say, well, but Christ commanded believers to be mm, one and to be charitable yeah. to one another. Did he did yeah. he answer that objection? Yeah, so, so Pius XI, actually, he does go through the encyclical and, and, and does mention, he says, yes, but there are people who say this, but here's the answer. So, yes, he does He does take on sort of the, the common objections. Christ commanded the believers that everyone be one, you know, that, that you may all be one and united, uh, be charitable to one another. And he says, well, yes, of course. I mean, <laughs> there is a truth to that, of course. There is um, there's an absolute truth to that. If it is understood, you know, who, again, we get back to the Protestant problem here of who gets to interpret Scripture. But that's, that's, I'm sure that's a whole other conference of the private interpretation of Scripture. But the Pope says, listen, yes, God, uh, God d- does want all men to be one, of course, but he wants them all to be one in the true faith, of course. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a very clear understanding. Um, God did not just give us a natural law only. He, he did give us that. But he, he did send his only son to, to teach us, uh, to give us a clear uh, explanation of what is the way, the way to, that he wants to serve God, that he wants us to serve God. A religion cannot be true or valuable or good if it does not, uh, is not built on the revelation of, of God himself. You know, if Christ finds it, founded a church that men uh, should follow, uh, then we can't d- disagree and say, well, we like our own individual way. We, we like this way. He said, no, there, there's one way that's been revealed. And this church is visible. It consists of one body, having one faith, one authority. It's a, it's a perfect society in itself. doesn't mean all the members are perfect, but it's a perfect right. society in itself. Um, it will last until the end of, the, um, the end of this uh, earth. Uh, and its role is to, to lead men to salvation. Uh, and it has all the necessary qualities. It has all the, let's say, the tools and the the resources to to save souls. So that's that's sort of the, his uh, his objection. The objection is: Listen, our Lord commanded that we all be one. Absolutely, but it's it's assuming that the church is not already uni- unified. There's this kind of idea that well, we're not really unified yet in the Catholic Church, so we want to keep working towards that unity. And and the Pope Pius XI is saying, well, yes, but there is a unity, unity of faith, unity of you know of the doctrine, of the unity of the sacraments, unity under the authority of of the hierarchy. Yeah, he said all these things exist. Doesn't mean that every individual is is perfectly unified, but as a, as a, as an institution created by Christ, it's fully unified, of course. Right. So there's this there's this term that the church of christ and mm. um and protestants and and many others who are going to be pushing for this ecumenism are going to be using this term the church of christ in order to try to say well there's there is one body but it's made up of multiple different churches and all these churches have the same rights uh and that's n- entirely not the the catholic position on this yes it's one of these again you come across this and you, and you, sort of the, the logical mind cannot really grasp what they mean because of course, as you know, it's not really defined. It's saying this this ecumenical Church of Christ, which we want to create, everyone gets to keep their own individual churches, their own individual locations, their own individual structure, their own beliefs. They all have the same rights. Um, we're just going to kind of rally around. We're going to unite ourselves around this minimal set of doctrines, this sort of like a common profession of faith that we all agree on. There's no real need for this papal authority. You know, that's sort of a, a corruption uh, that was later in the church. You know, after some of the early centuries, the, the Catholic Church started insisting on this papal authority, which is ridiculous and it's not really needed. It's nice to have a figurehead. You know, it's nice to have the queen, but we don't really need uh, that. It's sort of, you know, they can say nice things. They can sort of rubber stamp uh, what we want to do, but really it's um it's not we don't need a, a sense of authority uh, they even say uh, the primacy of the pope just causes division and just causes confusion which, which as i say is ironic because <laughs> there's no one who's had more splinters and breakaways and individual uh, problems than the protestant churches i mean there's tens of thousands of of independent 
Protestant churches with nothing but division, and then you know they disagree amongst themselves, and they break away into another group, and they break away into another group, and they break away into another group. So they they sort of reject this idea of the papal authority. So that's not needed. We just need a, a, a pope. Maybe the pope can stay in his position. It'll be a primacy of honor. He'll have some you know little, little limited power. That's sort of by agreement we allow him to make decisions. Maybe you know. We can, we can, he can preside over as a, as a figurehead. And that would be a good, that would be the new ecumenical church of Christ. But he doesn't really, the faithful, the, the Catholics or Christians in this new ecumenical church don't need to obey him or change their beliefs. It's sort of just a, uh, I would say an, an empty title, we would say. And the Pope Pius XI says, no, no, this doesn't work. He said, you know, it just doesn't work. And Pius XI so, in, in this encyclical, he's also going to talk about why the Pope and Catholics themselves can't participate in mm. ecumenical gatherings or gatherings of other religions, which sure. is going to be completely contradicted by later <laughs> Popes. Um, yeah. But yeah, be yeah, that as yeah. it may. Yeah. No, that, that's 100% correct, which is it was absolutely, it would be unheard of what has happened since uh, the Second Vatican Council, uh, the most famously being, of course, Pope John Paul II at, at the first Assisi. But there have been many of those, not only on the level of the Holy Father, but also at, in individual dioceses around the world. And it's sort of a universal practice now that every diocese has its own interreligious ecumenical pastor or priest who's in charge of it. And they have, they set up meetings all the time and they have these ecumenical. No, the Pius XI said, no, no, you cannot. Catholics, the Pope, the Catholics, they cannot participate in ecumenical gatherings. Number one, it implies uh, the Catholic Church is not the true church, that we have something that we need to learn from from these other false religions. That's the first problem. It also implies the Holy Ghost is no longer there to guide the church, that the church has fallen into error and needs dialogue to bring it back into the fullness of truth. Or, or even just that the Catholic Church is still searching for truth or searching for unity and has, had, has not yet found it or maybe had it and lost it. It's a sort of well, yes, it's a Church of Christ, but it's not. It's having a bad day, and it's sort of lost the plot. And we need to have lots more dialogue uh, so that um, we can find it again. It's like, well, is it the Church of Christ? Is the Holy Ghost still guiding it? Uh, is it the true Church? So, yeah, Pope Pius XI says, no, this is this is ridiculous. This is not 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 going to happen. It, it's not a good idea. People would argue against him, and, and did argue against him at the time. And again, these are common arguments today as well that you need ecumenism because that's the charitable thing to do. So they would argue mm, yeah, charity yeah. is the reason why you need to have ecumenism. Uh, does he answer that? Yes. Yes. Pius XI, that's the, as you say, it's a very, it was an argument back then. It's even more an argument now where you can talk with people who are not Catholic and they say, well, why would you say our religion is wrong? That's, that's very uncharitable. That's very judgmental of you. And it's against charity and, and God is, Charity. So Pius XI says, okay, there's this objection about, uh, it's, it's uncharitable to, to, to try to convert and bring souls and correct them from their errors. He says, no, true charity has to have faith for its foundation. You cannot have charity mm. if you don't have the faith. Uh, that's just one of the basic, uh, laws of, of how the virtues work. Uh, I mean, he says even St. John, the, the great apostle of love, the apostle of charity, tells us to, to shun, uh, to stay away from heretics. You know, it's in the epistle of St. John, uh, second epistle of John. If any man come to you and bring not this doctrine, do not receive him into your house and do not say to him, God speed you or give him any greeting. So, yeah, uh, St. Saint, Saint John, the apostle of love, was very strong with those who who left the doctrine of our Lord, who, who said, okay, that's the doctrine of the Lord, but I don't like it, and they fall into heresy. He says, listen, you know, it doesn't say that you, you cannot love them, pray for them, but the Pius XI makes this clear that being charitable men, of course, yeah, you pray for them, you res you give them a certain respect as, as a human being, one who has been, uh, who our Lord has died for, of course, but do not pretend that their false religion is is true. That would be the the height of false charity. That would, in fact, be hatred. If you if you hate someone, you don't bring them out of their error. Uh, if you hate someone, you you don't want them to to find the truth. So he said, no. On, on the contrary, it is most charitable to, in whatever way is best, in whatever the circumstances are, according to prudence, according to all these things, 
to have a zeal to to bring them to the true faith. Maybe that takes months. Maybe it takes years. Maybe it takes uh, one conversation. But the point is more: it is the height of charity to desire the conversion of of souls to bring them into the one fold of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 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 clear. That's the that's what Pius XI says. Listen, this is this is a, a foolish objection, and here's the answer to it. You know, so. Uh, and that's so that that's kind of our, our overview of what Pius XI said, um, and and he goes through this like, like he said point by point he goes through and and mm. oh yeah uh, lets people yeah. know how to how to be ecumenical in a sense and, and what the yes. errors are. Yeah. Um, on a more practical level, how did the church approach ecumenism? So we know the principles. We've gone through the principles here. How did the church approach ecumenism? How did they reach out to uh, okay. people of other faiths, the, the Protestants or Orthodox or, or whatever? Do, at the time before the Second Vatican Council. Okay, so the, the, it's it's a good example that uh, sorry, it's a good question that you know the, the church has done every way possible that you could think of. Uh, one of the the most obvious being, of course, at, at different councils or different uh, uh, events, even in in the past, the the church has invited them, like with very nice letters saying, "Listen, we." We, we do invite you back in. We do ask you to, you know, this, that maybe even not just Protestants, but, you know, the, the Catholic, let's say, schismatics, uh, for some of the Orthodox churches. Please come to this ecumenical council. We want you to come back into the, the, the true church, um, out of your schism, um, or the inviting, um, even in the 19th century, inviting Protestants to come to the, to the first Vatican council to, to observe and to simply, Learn the faith, learn what the church teaches, and 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 many times these these resulted in conversions. Um, there were several good examples of that, and in, in, in even more even modern history, recent history, where there's this, a very charitable invite. Please come and 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 sit down and talk with us. We want to show you the the truths of the Catholic faith. Um, it was never the other way around, saying let's just talk about what you like to do in your religion, what we like to do in our religion, and we can come to an understanding. It's like, well, no, this w- we believe that you know these are the truths of our Lord, and we would like to explain them to you. So that's sort of on an overall level. But as you probably have heard many times, uh, as the priest often say in sermons, the best way to convert souls is to to be a very good Catholic, to to try to to live a virtuous life, to live a life of uh, of to know, love, and serve God as best you can. That is the number one way that you bring about converts, and and you see that in the in the recent centuries when you have a lot of movements of conversion. A lot of it was simply Catholics who were very impressive, who were living a good life, who were their neighbors see them living a good Catholic life, and they say, "Gosh, there's something there. These people are happy. They they live a good and wholesome life. They practice virtue." There's something there. There's something there. And so that's sort of the best way to convert people. But but again, the main way the church officially does it is by literally sending out priests and nuns and brothers to any country they could and every country they would. Say, listen, go out and set up schools, set up missions, uh, go to these people and, and help them on the natural level, help them on the supernatural level. Do everything you can to to bring them to the true faith. And and that's that's the history of the church is one of missionary work, for sure, wow. for sure. So now we get into the period after the Second Vatican Council. So uh, Udunum Seed, uh, you mentioned that okay. that's, a, that's an encyclical by. Um, um, yeah, it's sure sort of I... a. It's it's sorry. It's it's sort of an update on a, a renewal of that original uh, document of the Second Vatican, Second Vatican Council on on ecumenism. So in fact, as I as I as, as I mentioned it. The Udunum City, if you go through the footnotes, um, you know, there's like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of footnotes. And what you find is most of them are referring to either documents of Vatican II or the document on ecumenism. Pope John uh, Paul II is talking, basically saying, here's what they said at the Vatican Council, and I think it's very true, and, and he elaborates a bit more. Um, so really, it, it's Udunum Sint is a good example of 30 years after the Council finishes, he says, okay, it's been 30 years this document on, on, from Vatican II is not only very much still valid, it's still, we promote it even more, and maybe we didn't even go far, far enough. We can look at Udunum Sin, it's, it's, it's a real, I would say, difficult chore for people to read. Someone reads it and they just say, gosh, I, I'm not sure what I've just read. You know, they sort of introduce 
a, a novelty, a change of definition saying, oh, you know, this is the way we want to do it from now on. It was not working so well in the other way. But we still reaffirm all the basic tenets of this, of the faith or that classic. We, we should change everything about the past, about the way we operate. However, we must not lose our respect and our reverence for the, the perennial truths of the faith, which we are now discarding. Uh, or we must look at all the good things and all the truths that we share with other religions. However, we must never change or compromise on essential matters of the faith. It's like, well, which one, which one is it? It's, right. it's sort of vague enough that they can maybe say, well, it's not a contradiction. You're like, well, maybe not a direct contradiction, but it certainly is not clear and precise. It doesn't, we don't really know what we're saying here. Uh, and that's when you talk about, I'm sure you've talked about are those those time bombs and the, the language that is so vague or so confusing that you can interpret it any which way you want. And that's certainly true in Ut Unum Sint of John Paul II of, uh, I think it was 1995. It's, it's interesting. There's there's a quote in here in, in the notes that you passed along to me that we're also posting on the website. Um, he says in here, interconfessional dialogues at the theological level have produced positive and tangible <laughs> results. Yes. What results could those be? I mean, I'm, I'm going all the way back to our first episode, episode number one, where when Father McFarlane and I talked about, is there a crisis? And we talked about all the, all the degradation mm. of vocations and mass attendance mm, and belief mm, and the mm, catechesis mm. and everything. What possible tangible results have there been that he's referring yes, to here? Yes, this is, this is a classic. This is one of many of these classic things where they, there's a statement made with, of course, not only zero proof, but the con contrary proof is, as you say, not only not positive and tangible results, the opposite is true, that right. the the number of uh, vocations, as you say, but also just conversions are, are not even talked about anymore. It's, it's um, uh, except for maybe in some countries having a good birth rate, the Catholic right. Catholics are not necessarily converting other souls at a, at a good level. So, but yeah, they, they say these things, they say, you know, these dialogues are producing great results like well okay but what are these results and and first of all i don't see them number one but but let's look at the facts and see are, are there positive you know what is this so yeah that's a classic sort of uh, confusing statement that they they say um and even in the same statement i think they say uh however there are doctrinal differences that need to be resolved it's like well okay does the Catholic Church have doctrinal differences that need to be resolved? If it does, then it's no longer the true Church of Christ. Right. Um, what are they saying? Again, it's, it's very confusing. It doesn't really make much sense. He's talking about, in, in another section here, he's talking about the uh, liturgical renewal that has been carried out has, has allowed mm, for convergences mm. on what is essential. And he says, uh, mm. they, I'm, I'm assuming he means people of different, different Christian religions or different faiths, they're able to turn to the Father with one heart. Yes, yes. What does that mean? This was this or was a very this this was a very telling uh, part of his encyclical where he sort of maybe accidentally admits that yes, because we had this liturgical renewal, the Novus Ordo Mise, it's completely acceptable and uh, help uh, almost designed perfectly for non-Catholics to to. There's nothing objectionable. There's nothing that's going to offend them. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, when you look at this, you think actually ecumenism is what maybe helped with this destruction of the mass that if the, if you have an ecumenical a false ecumenism in your mind you definitely want to change the the traditional mass and the novus ordo mass and again that false uh statement oh now because we have the the the, the liturgical renewal we can all together turn to the father with one heart it's like, well, what is that? What do you mean, one heart? You do, you disagree on all these major doctrinal things, these major teachings of of morality. How can you have one heart? Um, right. And then he has that that classic thing, which we hear so often, which is, well, they don't have full communion, but they're close. It's very close. And you know, he, the Pope says, you know, a century ago, who would have thought we'd be so close? I'm like, well, that's, uh, that's very much, uh, let's say, um, optimistic thinking. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit much to say. Uh, but it is interesting because he does say this liturgical renewal makes this more possible. Oh, okay. So that's the reason for many of the changes of the uh, Novus Ordo Mass. It's it's almost like it's almost like the Holy Father, in a sense, is is giving out participation trophies. 
Uh, yes. You know, you, you got really close, and so you get a trophy, and that means something, but it doesn't. Yes. This is, again, if either you're in communion or not in communion, but what does it mean when you show up before the pearly gates and say, listen, I was, I was not in full communion. I did not follow the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ totally, but I took some of it, and I like some of it. <laughs> it's like, well... That doesn't help you. It, right. it doesn't help you. It's it's not. Our Lord did not say, "Accept you know ninety percent or seventy five percent of my teachings." That's a, that's enough. Right. No, it's either they're all true or they're not true. It's you can't it's either or. Um, there's um, there's a story about Archbishop Lefebvre when he mm, was working mm. in Dakar. Could you could yeah. you tell us the, this well, this anecdote? What, 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 yeah, what I can do is I can mention this. It's in the, it's in the book of, of Bishop Tissier de Malare. It's very interesting because you can sort of compare and contrast that with, um, you know, the sensitivities, the, the mindset of Catholics, uh, of, especially Catholic clergy, uh, before the Second Vatican Council. And then you can afterwards, uh, you can maybe show a little clip of, of just recently Cardinal Ranjit and, um, in Sri Lanka is the main, you know, the cardinal there. He's, he, he was a, bit, a very big person. I mean, he's, he was a secretary for the Congregation for Evangelizations of Peoples. He was a secretary for the Divine Worship, Discipline of Sacraments. He's a big player and considered very conservative. And you can see what, what he says. Uh, and then you compare and contrast that with Archbishop Lefebvre back in the 1950s. There had been some comments and some criticisms leveled at the Catholic community, at the Catholic Church, that we are involved in this whole movement aimed at some of the top performers in society, like singers, actors, musicians, cricketers, cinema directors, all these people, that the Catholic Church is behind what the pastors are doing and trying to convert them to Christianity. Catholic community, we have the Roman Catholic community and the non-RC Catholic communities. And then we have the evangelical Christian communities and then the the so-called pastors. We have no intention of converting the whole of Sri Lanka to Catholicism. These pastors are appealing to the base instincts of human beings. For example, economic problems, some of them are social problems. There is no way in which we can create magic out of Jesus Christ. You know, you have 3,000 rupees in your purse and by saying a prayer, you are going to make it multiply into 6,000 rupees. Or you have uh, your battery in the telephone can be charged by prayer. These are all uh, rather stupid also to believe that Jesus Christ can be brought down to that level. Christianity is not magic. Therefore, these pastors who try to fool around with magic, this is not correct and misleading, giving a wrong impression of Christianity. We don't accept this and we want to say that the government should investigate who these people are, why they are here, from where do they get these funds and why are they trying to create religious disharmony in this country between the different communities. We are not part of this strategy to try to make use of the problems that people have in order to convert them to Jesus Christ with tomfoolery. You know, he's still working in the D- Dakar. Um, there's, this, there's this famous situation where there's a, a plane goes down and there's a plane accident and everybody dies. Uh, you know, 160 people die. But they're not Catholics. They're Catholics plus, you know, uh, Muslims or, or Protestants. You know, it's just a mixture of people, unlike on any plane. And, and it's such a, a bad plane crash, they can't even distinguish uh, the d- individual bodies. So they say, okay, well, we can't really, we have to have a, a group burial. Um, Archbishop Lefebvre was away traveling, visiting his, his, his uh, places. So his vicar general, Father Boussard, was asked by Air France, can you, can you come together and make a joint ceremony with the Muslims and Protestants for this mass burial? Uh, the vicar general says, okay, well, we can do this. Um, maybe the in- apostolic nuncio can do the, the funeral ceremony. He'll do it first and then he'll leave. Um, you know, even, even already he's thinking, you know, we can't do a joint ceremony, but I could do the ceremony of the Catholic burial and then leave. Uh, then we'll, that, that will be less, uh, less objectionable. But the, the nuncio, so he does it. He gives the absolution. He gives the normal blessings at a funeral. 
uh, and then and then leaves. And then, of course, the Protestant pastor comes in and reads some stuff from Scripture. Then the Marabut, the the Muslim religious leader, comes and does does his own thing. So the day following, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre returns from his um, travels, and he'd heard the the ceremony on the radio, and he said to the vicar general. Did you get permission for that? I, why would you? Why would we get involved with that? That's that's communicatio in sacris. That's uh, partaking in a in a sacred thing with those of a false religion. And the vicar justice, no, no, no. It's, it's not like you think. We, we did the ceremony separately. Even the apostolic nuncio okayed it. He approved it. And actually, the fact, you know, he disagrees. He says, no, this priest, the, even the nuncio, you've you've compromised a little bit here. Uh, uh, you're putting the Catholic faith on the same level. As these two other religions, it's sort of, it's getting too close to indifferentism or even a false ecumenism. So even, you know, this is 1950s, not so long ago, already there was still this clear idea, listen, the Catholic faith is not put on the same table uh, as these other false religions. And, and even looking at that, you think, well, gosh, that wasn't so bad. Right. That's how that's how serious that it, it was always understood that the Catholic faith is the true faith. It doesn't sort of... Uh, we don't have the same ceremonies, and you don't have false ceremonies put on the same level as true ceremonies. That's how clear it was. And then, of course, you know, you you can show, uh, you can see now the the, the video of uh, of Cardinal Van just saying, "Well, no, uh, we're not trying to convert other persons." It's like, well, w- wait a minute. These are two contradictory positions here. Um, one of them can only one of them can be true, but they both can't be true. Um, so I think that's that's a good example that you can see there, right. um, of sort of the effect of uh, of the the consequences of the the new false ecumenism um, promoted in Vatican II and also by Pope John Paul II and 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 others as well, not not just him, but he's sort of one of the more famous, uh, one of the most famous of them, because of a CC and all these other things. So. Yeah. Well, so. Taking a step backwards, then, uh, and, or I guess looking at it from from a, from a more thirty thousand foot view or whatever, um, ecumenism. It's the I guess we could say the best of intentions, if you want to say that yeah, for yeah, the yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, for the for the priests and in, in, in the council fathers who are trying to make the Catholic Church more acceptable to Protestants, more acceptable to for people to come in. It didn't work, and it's not mm-hmm. working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 basically yeah. Maybe the the strategy was well, we need to be less. We we in the past we were confrontational or we looked prideful because we were saying that we have the true faith and they don't, and therefore we need to come up with a better a better strategy from now on, which is we we don't talk about what separates us. We only talk about what um, unites us, um, and therefore and they keep repeating the same mantra over and over again that that dialogue. More and more dialogue simply creates more and more unity. Um, as if, you know, you can imagine a, a husband and wife have a severe problem in their marriage. If they just talk for a thousand hours, then everything will be okay. <laughs> it's like, well, no, there needs to be a change in behavior or a, a forgiveness or a acceptance. There needs to be something that actually happens, not this, this classic mantra of the more dialogue, the more unity. It's like, well, I, I don't know how that is ever able to be proven. Right. Um, because dialogue is dialogue. It's two people discussing things. Uh, if there's a major difference on doctrine, you know, the, the husband and the wife are talking, the husband says, no, no, it's, it's okay for me to, to, my doctrine is that I can have uh, 10 wives or 10 mistresses. And the wife says, no, no, we, we don't agree on that. Well, let's just talk more and more about it. And eventually we will come to unity on this matter. It's like, well, no, there's a serious difference of <laughs> what you think marriage is and what I think marriage is. Okay. Uh, and that's sort of the idea of the, you know, the pre-Vatican II is the idea of, listen, we, we can't change the doctrine of the church to, to make it less offensive or make it more acceptable. It's the doctrine is our Lord gives it to us. We, we can't change it. Maybe we can explain it in a, in a, in a more, uh, let's say fluid manner. Maybe it's, it's, it's easier to, uh, it's easy, it's easier for some people if we explain it this way, but we cannot change the teaching. We just have to maybe, Work, work more at uh, a better explanation because you know we're human beings. We we don't always communicate in the best manner. But, but again, that that's not changing the the dialogue. Doesn't change that. It just simply uh, it happens, so to speak. When, when I get home this evening, I'll I'll try that out, Father, and, and see how it goes. <laughs> I'll, I'll try out some that's dialogue right. and see if I can change 
Mrs. That's right. Something mind on That's him. right. You got to change the essential nature of marriage by dialogue. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm not sure that works. Uh, I, I don't have high hopes for, for that, but we'll see. <laughs> yes. Um, looking at, at, at your apostolate father, uh, we mentioned at the beginning, and I guess we'll come full, full circle. Um, you're in Malaysia, you're in Sri Lanka, you're in the Philippines, you're, you know, you're truly, if, if we can say that any district is, is really a missionary district for the Society of St. Pius X, it's, it's, it's you, maybe, maybe Africa as well. Um, mm. How has this notion of ecumenism impacted uh, uh, okay. for good or for ill how you, how you yeah, evangelize? Well, uh, well, sure. I, I don't know that it's changed much for us. What, what's more, I say, what became more obvious the more we travel around and, and, and we have, you know, maybe 10 countries we go to in this, in this vast region of, of age, of Asia, um, is that the, the modus operandi of all these dioceses that we see, the, the, the manner in which they operate is, is very much in, in accord with this ecumenism. As I said, all of them that I know of have these ecumenical outreaches and they have these dialogue sessions and they have these joint ceremonies together. Um, it's sort of just commonplace. It's not even shocking anymore. Uh, but not only is there no tangible results, uh, but what we see is that the, their concept now is we have these Catholics, they're born into the Catholic faith or maybe sometimes they marry into the Catholic faith those are who we take care of. That's the mission. We want them to live the gospel. Oh, okay, that's fine. But what about all these other, I mean, they're literally billions, and I don't, I don't say that easily, billions of souls yeah. who are in uh, the darkness of idolatry, uh, paganism, uh, er- er- just simply error. So you, you have this ecumenical fruit, this fruit of this false ecumenism, which is that that missionary desire is is extinguished. That that fire in, in the in the in the Catholic priest, the Catholic nun, the Catholic brother, the Catholic faithful, this desire to say, "Hey, we want to bring these souls out of their darkness. They live and die in this in this darkness in this world filled of 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 error, uh, of idolatry, paganism, or, or whatever error it might be." And say, listen, I want to bring them into the, to the true faith for, for their own good, for their, for the common good, but for their individual good, that they can be happy, that they can save their souls and be happy for eternity. That's gone. That, that, when you talk about, uh, one of the, the most obvious fruits of, of a false ecumenism, it's this, is that there is no more this desire. I'll give you another example. Um, on the same thing, I'm speaking to an older priest. I don't know. Maybe he's in his eighties. Uh, he was in the seminary in, in one of these Asian countries. There's only one seminary uh, in this particular country. And he's in this seminary in the, in the, in the 60s, the 1960s. And I'm talking to him about it. And, the, and he's a conservative priest. And he sees some of the problems. And he says, well, I said, well, what about ecumenism? What did they teach you about this in the 1960s in the seminary? And he said, oh, well, you know, we, it was a very big deal. It was all very fresh and new. And it was the way forward. It was the the new... Uh, the new strategy and how we're going to do this. And I said, yes, but, but for example, here in Asia or even in America, but I said, you know, we are the result of great missionary work of, of previous generations who have converted our forefathers. I said, well, how do they explain that if, if it's just a question of dialogue and, and, and these meetings? And then the priest said, well, no, we never talked about that. He said, in fact, there was a sort of embarrassment about these previous great saints, these great brothers and sisters and priests and bishops who, who came in previous centuries to, to bring the faith to, to, to our countries. And I said, yeah, I said, that's sort of what I would expect. I said, uh, I said the, the greatest irony of all is that your seminary is named after St. Francis Xavier. <laughs> it's like one of the, it's called the new St. Paul. I mean, St. Francis Xavier is, is, is considered the, the modern uh, St. Paul. He was so uh, prolific in his conversions and his apostolic zeal for, to bring souls out of, out of error. And that's sort of now an embarrassment. It's like, well, in his day, he sort of understood it in this way, but now we are more enlightened. Now we more understand how it, how we should operate. It's like, like you would not have a seminary. You would not physically be seminarians or priests or Catholics if Franz Xavier and others like him did not come here and precisely uh, work for the conversion of souls. It's like, they, Franz Xavier did not come out and decide to dialogue. No, no he, he, he destroyed idols and converted souls and did all sorts of amazing things. 
but not anything to do with this ecumenism. And uh, so oh. it's sort of, to me, it was a horrible irony. It's like, look, the seminary is named after Francis Xavier, and you're basically telling us that what he did was wrong or what he did was no longer relevant. It's like you wouldn't even be Catholic if it weren't for him. It's, it's, it's just insane to me. Uh, it's, you know, biting the hand that feeds you. It's uh, cutting your nose off to spite your face. It's any number of, um, of yeah. cliches. Yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So that was an interesting conversation because I just was, and, and of course this priest was a good priest. He understood this. He said, yes, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. But they, they could not really talk about this missionary uh, or, or they try to reduce this missionary thing into, well, we're here to take care of our Catholics and to spread the gospel of peace. It's like, well, yes, that's all good, but what about converting other souls? And again, we have to answer for uh, the billions of souls that we have not converted. We, it's, it's on our shoulders to, to try to do what we can. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a real, that's where the fire of, of missionary zeal has to be there. Uh, and ecumenism sort of is this, you know, damp blanket dropped on that, that fire and uh, it's a fire blanket and it just, it just kills, uh, it just kills that. And that's certainly true. What, what we see here is the Catholic, uh, let's say the, in the Novus Ordo and the, this idea of false ecumenism, it really is. We take care of those who are already Catholic. You know, we do what we can for them. Um, but that's it. You know, there's the, the we don't see any more of this. Um, missionary zeal, and uh, that's that's a real tragedy because the consequences of that are how many how many more thousands or millions of souls who who do not find the true faith. That's that's a real disaster. So a priest a priest like you would be just turned into a, a social worker. I mean, yeah, you you keep the, yeah you keep the yeah. Catholics in 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 tow and you preach the gospel to them, but then for everyone else, like you feed them and you clothe them and you don't preach to them. Yes, there's a sort of idea that uh, the priest is a functionary. It's sort of uh, like you see this in every country, really. The priest becomes right. a functionary. He he um, he gives the sacraments uh, according to the schedule. He says the right things. He does whatever particular devotions that might be appreciated in that area, and that's about it. Easy. It's a nine to five job, and. Um, you know, it's you wonder anymore. Do they want to convert other souls? You know, right. that's the question. Maybe that's too much work. Or I don't know. Maybe it just causes more problems. I don't know. It's a good yeah. question. Well, this is a fascinating look back at um, at not just the the problems of Vatican II, but also looking at at what Pius XI said and, and understanding this true notion of what ecumenism is. Uh, and thank you for keeping that up and alive in, in well, your work and your travels father we have to do a lot more than what we're doing but yes uh, obviously uh, we ask for all the the prayers of the listeners to to help uh, give us that that zeal that um perseverance and 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 a task that is impossible without without god's grace so my pleasure yeah, to talk to you all right thank you father i appreciate it god bless you thank you Thank you for listening to and watching episode 27 of our Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. In episode 28, we'll be speaking with Father Jonathan Loop on the topic of religious liberty. This concept was one of the major errors of Vatican II, which threatens not only the public practice of the Catholic faith, but disturbs entire social orders by stripping away from the state the higher purpose of caring for the souls of its people. If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Please share this episode with someone who you think might enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And finally, if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of 5 or 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this crisis in the church project. Until next week, thank you for listening, and God bless you.